Okay, let me discuss the decision that President Bush the first had in 1991, once Iraq had been pushed out, and just shows you this again shows you the dimensions of complexity. That coming into this region, which was drawn up by outsiders, which whose states are often irrationally conceived, not unlike sub-Saharan Africa, done by outsiders. And what happens now when the very outsiders come in here and try to project a new round of uh, self-interested and acquisitive politics, all right? So the United States pushes Saddam Hussein out, all right? Should you just stop at the border right here? with Kuwait and Iraq, not go into Iraq, or should the United States go all the way in and knock out the Saddam regime, which is, become, which is destabilizing the region? All right. Now, here's the reason. Here's, uh, uh, here's the, the problem if you're the United States. If you go into Iraq and you knock out the regime, you take out Saddam Hussein, he's the glue holding this thing together. What happens if you knock out that regime? And the Kurds up here, at least the, 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 the portion of the Kurds that are in Iraq, they say, hey, look, this is our opportunity to break free and form a Kurdish state. And therefore, Iraq breaks apart up here. Now, what that means is most of the Kurds in Turkey would also be invigorated and either fight against Turkey or talk about forming union with this new Kurdish state. And this Kurdish state would like likely to be vi uh, viable as a state because it has so much oil. Therefore, the problem with that is that Turkey is a strong U.S. ally. Turkey, like I said, critical to the geopolitical concerns of the United States because it bottles up Russia. You don't want to anger the Turks. In fact, the Turks made a uh, said openly, if there is any talk about this portion of Iraq becoming an independent state, it told the United States, we will send our troops in here. And by the way, they would do that years later, which I'll talk about. They'll run, they ran their troops right past American troops and in to put down any notion in northern Iraq of becoming a state. So that's a problem if you go in here and knock out the Saddam regime. If you knock out the Saddam regime, here's another possible problem. Down here, the Shia Muslims, which feel themselves to be long persecuted by the Sunni Muslims and Saddam specifically, well, they're right next door to the very core state of Shia Islam, and that's Iran. And of course, the United States is an enemy of Iran since 1979. And therefore, the notion of Shia Muslims aligning, from the outside perspective, it's a little simplistic, nevertheless, the notion of Shia Muslims aligning with other Shia Muslims here in Iran, and therefore, essentially, increasing the influence of Iran is very unattractive. That's going to create another division. You may get another state over here, who knows? It would take a lot of oil with it to be allied with Iran, not good from the United States perspective. Moreover, if this thing, if, if Iraq broke, broke apart because Saddam was knocked out, the rest of Sunni Islam would be upset, which is your strong allies of the United States, especially this oil producing Saudi Arabia down over here, because they would see the empowerment of Shia Muslims over here, and they would see that there's no bulwark between them and Iran. They tended to be quite sympathetic to Saddam and his atrocities. Do you see the problem why the United States was thinking, perhaps we don't want to go in and knock out that regime? That's exactly what George Bush the first said, was, th was thinking about. And, and by the way, if the United States had went in, went in, the coalition of countries, of Western countries, by the way, that included Syria, all right, of Western countries that had went into Iraq, with the United States, they did not support that, and therefore the Western coalition would have been broken up. So what does, what did George Bush the first decide to do? You can see that here in this slide, President Bush made the following statement. <laughs> 
Quote, going in and occupying Iraq, thus unilaterally exceeding the UN's mandate, would have destroyed the precedent of international response to aggression we hoped to establish. Had we gone in the invasion, had we gone the invasion route, the United States could conceivably still be an occupying power in a bitterly hostile land. And this was written years later, seven years later. It would have been a dramatically different and perhaps barren outcome if we had gone into Iraq. The United States was thinking, better to have stability in Iraq of a nasty regime under Saddam rather than massive instability that could spread all over the place. Here, you with Iraq, Saddam still in, in Iraq, you have one problematic state to deal with. You may have three if you went in here and knocked out that regime with a whole bunch of other associated problems coming up. Thus, you see how complex that was, and so George Bush the first decided not to go in. Now, why does that need to be mentioned and looked at with that much detail? Because a fascinating thing happens 12 years later. This was 1991 that George Bush the first decided not to go in to Iraq. 12 years later, in 2003, his son, as you can see here, here's George Bush the first, and then here's George Bush the second. His son decides to reverse his father's wisdom and go into Iraq, mount an invasion of Iraq. Nobody quite understands why George Bush the second decided to go into Iraq in 2003. But let me give you the principal reason that was put forth by George Bush the second. You can see here. Iraq was said to have weapons of mass destruction. This is uh, Bush's uh, Secretary of State, Colin Powell, here at the United Nations, proclaiming to an absolute certainty of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. He said he even had a sample, as you can see there. Exact photos were provided, uh, locations, everything. There was no doubt, said the U.S. Secretary of State Powell. Powell. I believe George Tenet, the CIA, the, uh, the CIA chief, who's sitting right behind him, we can't see him there, actually said this was a slam dunk. There was no doubt that he had that. They said there were, these were not assertions, established facts. Now, complaining that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction by the United States struck many as astonishing in that the United States had sold him the base stock for his chemical weapons decades earlier. I already showed you the documentation for that. In fact, the U.S. Secretary of Defense for George Bush II was Donald Rumsfeld. So he, at this time, it was Donald Rumsfeld, and here's a picture of Donald Rumsfeld in 1983, 20 years late, earlier, with Saddam. During the period, the United States was selling Saddam weapons of mass destruction, in the sense of, uh, in the form of chemical weapons. It's the very same Secretary of Defense, 20 years later, who's saying that it's outrageous that Saddam had weapons of mass, mass destruction struck many as fascinating. So once the WMD rationale, we'll put it this way, it turned out, of course, that Saddam didn't have weapons of mass destruction. You're familiar with the 2003 war? The United States went in looking for them and they didn't exist. Now, some of you should respond and say, hold it, hold it, hold it. I thought you just told us about the Iran-Iraq war and Saddam Hussein used weapons of mass destruction in terms of chemical weapons. That's true. So you must think, you must be thinking there's a contradiction. They weren't there in 2003, but they were there in 1983 or 84, in that period. No contradiction. Chemical weapons have a shelf life. You might have them in 1983, but two decades later, you may not have them. They have a shelf life. They're a perishable commodity. And by 2003, Saddam's weapons of, of chemical weapons were, were essentially nullified just by existence. They didn't, they didn't exist.
The United States was wrong for going into Iraq in 2003 under that premise. In fact, the United States put forth various reasons after weapons of mass destruction put, were, were put forth. First off, I put them in line here. I think there was a couple of others, and I can't remember. I wrote these down for your from memory best as I can figure. The United States says it was in there to neutralize the WMD threat. That turned out to be incorrect. Then the United States said, okay, okay, that wasn't that, all right? We're here to fulfill United Nations resolutions. Well, the resolution that the United States put, the, the UN put forth was the notion of there was weapons of mass destruction, which there wasn't. But fulfilling United Nations resolutions couldn't have been the, the explanation because there are tons of UN resolutions that are unfulfilled, especially against Israel, which is almost next door. So the notion of that's the reason why the United States went in is also poor. All right. The elimination of a tyrant was put in. Well, the United States, like many other countries historically, supports tyrants. All kinds of tyrants still do. Even supported that one at a distance, especially during the Iran-Iraq war. In fact, the United States has taken down democracy in the region to reinstall a tyrant. In fact, when the United States got uh, rid of Saddam Hussein, the tyrant dominating Kuwait, the United States reinstalled the al-Sabah tyrant. The notion that that was put forth was struck many as an incredibly ridiculous statement. The notion was that the United States wanted to bring, that, that was put forth uh, as a reason we wanted to bring democracy to the Middle East. Well, obviously we didn't. We were going to support Saddam in power. We didn't support a democracy when we controlled Kuwait. We've taken down democracy. That is an absurd statement said to try to justify a war under a false premise. And then I believe it was Condoleezza Rice, who was the Secretary of Defense, if I recall at this time, or maybe the Secretary, the second Secretary of State, I can't remember. She said, uh, we went into Iraq as it would help solve the ongoing Palestinian-Israeli dispute. We already talked about the Palestinian-Israeli dispute. Uh, <laughs> What This doesn't have anything to do with the Palestinian-Israeli dispute. It can't possibly have any influence on that dispute. Why say it? Because most people don't understand the fineries here, and it sounds like a worthy cause. But it was ridiculous. Then the United States it was, said it was part of the war on terror. This makes no sense. Saddam was neither part or nor, nor a supporter of the 9-11 attackers of the, uh, on the United States. It had nothing to do with that. In fact, if you ever, ever understand a megalomaniac dictator, the last thing they're going to tol tolerate on their soil is some theologically div uh, 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 driven uh, uh, Islamic fanatic who doesn't listen, listen, uh, listen to temporal authorities, is driven by some kind of uh, law thing. All right, that's ridiculous. There was no, in fact, this was fundamental, uh, uh, ultimately admitted to by Vice President Cheney at the time and President Bush that Saddam had nothing to do with the war on terror. But it sounded good at the time, right? Because people would say, well, we're just fighting the war on terror, but there's no connection there. You're just using it. Then it said to keep oil fields out of the hands of terrorists. That's a remarkably strange rationale. If terrorists, whomever they may be, took over oil fields, ultimately they would just have to sell that oil to the world market. We can't, you, you just can't sit there and not use the oil. It has no purpose unless you sell it for money. And believe me, terrorists need money. And again, Saddam was not part of Arab terrorism anyway. It didn't make any sense. And then I put in parentheses because as I said it's, it, this was not presented as a reason for the initial war, but rather a reason to continue after the war had started. The United States said it was we should keep fighting despite an inaccurate or war basis so as to give meaning to the deaths of soldiers already fallen. You can see how tautological that is, how strange that is. Uh, we're going to fight because people have already died, so more people will die to support the new ones who will die, even though there was the original the original cause was what off. The point being is that was so ridiculous. That's why I put it in my italics. Well, the United States, like as I said, did go in in 2003, and it turned out to be uh, what the, the uh, elderly George Bush, the presidency, had predicted it would be. The United States occupied the country for what? About eight years. Uh, it was about 2003 to about 2011. It lost uh, soldiers. Um, I forget, somewhere about 4,400 soldiers were lost during this occupation. Of course, the United States was sitting on top of a country with all these internal divisions, with all these group, groups, with resentments and hatreds uh, that precede the United States occupation, but were only aggravated with the U.S. occupation. And folks, when you do an occupation in the underdeveloped world like this, 
your principal problem amongst many, but your principal problem is going to be young men between the age of probably 17 and 33, because all of a sudden, especially in a patriarchal society, a very machismo society, uh, you come in and uh, they're out of jobs. They're out of work because you disbanded their military. Their identity as male providers is gone. It's the foreign troops who are here, and the foreign troops can't provide enough employment or opportunity. They have power. They boss people around. This is going to cause resentment, no matter what the original cause for coming in was. This is always a problem. And this turned out to be a horrible circumstance for the United States. Its international prestige was damaged. It didn't solve any of the problems within Iraq. It was attacked uh, by IED, whatever. It was attacked by uh, military insurgents. And people were asking, what are we doing there? And of course, what further damaged the prestige of the United States was uh, things, practices like this. This was Abu Ghraib prison, which was, used to be Saddam's prison, uh, which he used to torture political opposition. And now the United States took it over after 2003, and the United States ultimately indulged in similar oppressive practices and perversions of terror and torture that Saddam and his like had indulged in. These are just some of the photos. The United States began filling it with prisoners who were exposed to treatment that uh, is, uh, well, whatever, <laughs> traditional to the region, shall we say. If I had time, I would talk about uh, the problem uh, with uh, a lot of the people who were put in to uh, the prison. And of course, they hadn't done anything. These are often just males taken in in sweeps, and you take them in and you interrogate them. And of course, they'll tell you anything you want if you torture them. It won't be accurate information, all right? Uh, but it's just going to lead to uh, an embarrassment. And when this came out, of course, it damaged the prestige of the United States in that it would indulge in these very things it said that tyrants do in any case. Okay, I've given you here just one example event, or, or two here, with innumerable tendril, tendrils of significance and consequence, which are implicit when you involve yourself into the warren of fragmented interests and objectives into this part of the world. There are many more I could talk about. And even these events do not convey the complexities here with respect to why the United States went into Iraq. Remember, these were the issues, you know, you, you have to, a, a fair observation perhaps for some of you to make is this. Look, uh, if these reasons were false, what was the reason for going in to Iraq when it was already predicted by the previous George, uh, Bush presidency that it would be a horrible mess and unlikely to be successful? Why go in? Well, remember that you could, I could respond to you and say, well, it's, it, it, ignorance is enough. The President Bush II was rather ignorant about these matters, or didn't care. And you could say, well, that's not enough to explain why, you, to, why would somebody go in when they have a misunderstanding of facts. But it turns out that there is a reason. You've not heard of it, or it's generally known about those who study this, these matters. And it has everything to do with the material imperatives that the outside interest, in this case the United States, have. Now, why did the United States go in here, therefore? Well, you remember this event, 9-11, a singular event in American history. These hijackers, of course, you're familiar with this, seized four planes and crashed them into buildings, or one crashed into a field. All right. This was a clear act of terrorism in the United States. Its effects were achieved. It caused astonishment and outrage. And if the objective was to make an impactful political statement, it succeeded. And you say, well, how does that explain going into Iraq? Well, follow along on what occurred here. 9-11 was carried out, or put it this way, as you can see over here on the right, 15 of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. All right, as you can see over here. All right. 
Now, remember the importance of oil. I've already put this graphic up. The absolute importance of oil in defining and supporting life and status in the developed world. Well, now you have the 9-11 attack. And the 15 of the 19 hijackers come from Saudi Arabia. And if we look at this graph here of Persian Gulf oil exporters, you can see how dominant Saudi Arabia is. You already know that Saudi Arabia is dominant in the world economy, but of course it's also dominant, uh, in, I mean, in terms of oil uh, production, but it's also dominant in the Persian Gulf, as you might suspect. All right, this is Saudi Arabia over here. Now, the United States, utterly dependent on that oil, as is the West. And if you look at the oil producers in the Persian Gulf, as you can see here, and as I indicated by the map, all of them, most all of them are U.S. allies, right? Saudi is the biggest important ally, but U.S. ally, U.S. ally, all right, another U.S. ally in Kuwait, that's why we threw Saddam out of there. The United States lost alliance with Iran, in 1979, I've talked about that already. Now, all of a sudden, this occurs in 9-11, where 15 of the 19 attackers on the United States comes from a strong U.S. ally in the Persian Gulf. And what that suggested to the United States, that it's possible that that that, that there's that, that possible there's a substantial amount of resistance in Saudi Arabia against the Saudi royal family who decides to be allied with the United States, especially since uh, these guys here were led by uh, this guy over here, which was Osama bin Laden. And he and his organization called Al-Qaeda, they were already conducting attacks within Saudi Arabia against the Saudi government. In fact, there's a movie that deals with that. I haven't seen it, but I've been told about it called The Kingdom. Anyway, and so here you have the Saudis attacking the Saudi government, which is such an important supplier of oil. And so therefore... This is a real threat. As I've indicated here with that uh, animation, if this strategic allies critical oil reserves, well, put it this way, one could conceive that this key alliance might very well be lost. It's possible it will it become uh, uh, destabilized by the fact that there are so many bombings and now they've extended to the United States. Therefore, one can ask the question that I've put here. If this strategic ally's critical oil reserves could be lost to the U.S. alliance, who is the next largest producer of oh-so-critical oil in the Persian Gulf other than the now hostile Iran? Who's the next largest producer that's not already in alliance with the United States? Well, you know what the answer to that is. Right there. Iraq. Iraq is the only other regional oil producer with a lot of oil. Other than thoroughly alienated Iran, whose oil reserves were not politically allied with the U.S. Iraq it had already been deemed part of the axis of evil. And the United States had already vanquished Iraq in 10 years earlier, or 12 years earlier, in the ejection from Kuwait. The United States had already had a long discussion on whether it should go into Iraq at the conclusion of the 1991 war. And the previous President Bush decided not to. Thus, therefore, the table was already set for a war of aggression on Iraq in 2003 under the initial guise of getting WMD, but ultimately to secure its oil resources consistent with U.S. geopolitics. Now you know the reason for that 2003 war.
that was it. It was always going to be a mundane, conventional reason. But you understand how you can't start a war over gaining control of oil. You can't state that publicly. You have to come up with things that concern the public whose support you ultimately need. And weapons of mass destruction scares people. Along with all those other reasons, it sounds like perhaps those are reasonable reasons. You can't say, I'm, you know, we're going to send in your son or daughter who might die, all right, to secure oil reserves. This was the reason for the Iraq, the, the war in 2003. If I had time, I would talk about the project for the new American century, which already talks about the need to take over Iraq. This was at the end of the first war to talk, uh, take uh, over the oil in Iraq to make sure the United States, almost all the Persian Gulf oil producers are allied with the United States. That was already uh, talk amongst the intelligence community anyway. All right, then. Thus, you have another chapter of the hyper-complex tissue of Middle East politics that exposes the material incentives behind outwardly cultural or humanitarian values that national governments publicly espouse. The hypocrisies and material truths behind ostensibly earnest resentments and values is yet further exemplified by the, react, the, the U.S. reaction uh, to, to this fellow here. And I'll talk about uh, a few more things about Osama bin Laden and, and show you how pulling one string now causes the collapse of another portion or another fabric of your internationalist garments here, but I'll do that on 